Having concluded male reproductive anatomy and physiology, let's move on to female. So, uh, and here once again, I think the pictures summarize it all. You know, awesome bods like Zac Efron, money, hot cars, and when my kids were in high school. They said, Dad, what's the secret to getting a date with women? I said, if you can tie a cherry stem into a knot with your tongue, you can get a date with any woman on planet Earth. They said, what? I said, just wait, you'll see. You'll find out later what I'm talking about. Okay, so, um, female internal anatomy. All right. Capsule of the ovary is once again enclosed in the tunica albuginea. Remember the white shirt? All right. And uh, ovary is attached to the uterus by the ovarian ligament. Okay, so this is just a ligament. This is not where the egg is traveling. This is just a piece of connective tissue to hold the ovary in place. You see, there's going to be a relationship here between the ovary and the uterus, and we want them to be in the right orientation to each other. So this ligament simply tries to hold the ovary there so that everything will work the way it's supposed to. Then the ovary is also attached to the pelvic wall by the suspensory ligament. So again, the idea here, it's kind of like, you know, when you you know, put something up and you have, you know, guy wires on it, all right? You, you're just, you're putting wires there to try to guarantee that this thing gets whole, held in a certain position, okay? Ovary is anchored by uh, a peritoneal fold, a fold of tissue of the peritoneum called the mesovarium. You can see the mesovarium there, all right? The ovary is attached to that. Once again, it's just holding the ovary in position, okay? And then there's the uterine tube. The old-fashioned name for this was the fallopian tube. We now just call it the uterine tube. So um, notice it expands at the end, right where the ovary is, with uh, the infundibulum. Remember the infundibulum of the pituitary, the little part that hung down? Um, and then there are these feather-like or finger-like projections over the ovary called the fimbriae. See them there, the fimbriae? You can see them in the upper left especially. All right, so the fimbriae uh, attach to the infundibulum, which is the last part of the uterine tube. Then the middle of the uterine tube is called the ampulla. And right where the uterine tube joins the uterus, that's called the isthmus, all right? Isthmus, you know, like a, isthmus is a narrow strip of land connecting two larger bodies, like the isthmus of Panama, you know, North and North America and South America connected by the isthmus of Panama. And then, of course, there's the famous Christmas song, I'm Dreaming of a Wide Isthmus, just like the one in Panama. All right, so just some basic uh, female anatomy there. Let's continue. Uterus has a superior curvature called the fundus, all right? Fundus is the dome-shaped top of an organ. Remember, we saw the stomach had a fundus as well. So it's just a region of the uterus, the dome-shaped top of the uterus. The middle portion is called the body, and the inferior portion is called the cervix. Remember, you have cervical vertebrae. Cervix means neck. So this is the neck of the uterus, all right? This is the opening into the uterus, all right? Simple terminology here, that's all it is. Then the uterine uh, wall consists of three layers, the parametrium, the myometrium, and the endometrium. So the parametrium goes around the outside. That's just basically a layer of tissue to you know, separate it from other things in your abdominal pelvic cavity. Myometrium, myomuscle. So this is the muscular layer because the uterus is gonna have to squeeze that little parasite out of there, all right? The contractions of labor are contractions of the myometrium. Then the inner lining is called the endometrium. Endo, innermost, inside, endometrium. This is the one that can cause some issues, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Then, once again, there are ligaments. The uterosacral ligaments attach the uterus to the sacrum, so it's holding it in place. Um, just like the ovary was held in place, we now have ligaments to hold the uterus in place. And then round ligaments attach the uterus to the abdominal wall. So again, just you know, like the, the wires that hold things in, in a particular position, okay? Broad ligaments then, you can see the broad ligament named because it is indeed broad, okay? Um, consists of the mesosalpinx and the mesometrium, which I mentioned before. Mesosalpinx, I don't think that's on your list. I don't think you have to know that. All right, just basic anatomy. Um, again, 
we saw there was the ovary, the uterine tube, and the uterus itself. Ovary, we didn't have separate parts. Through the uterine tube, we had all the different parts. And you can see them right here in the picture. There are the fimbriae, the infundibulum, the ampulla, and the isthmus. And then the uterus has the fundus, it has the body, and it has the cervix. So endometriosis, you've probably heard of this before. This is a condition in which endometrial tissue spreads up the uterine tubes and implants. So you can see the diagram on the top right, I think, shows it pretty well. You've got the um, endometrium, which is lining the uterus, all right? That's normally supposed to be there, all right? What can happen, though, is that the endometrium can spread outside. So we we'll see it high up in what they're still calling fallopian tubes. This must be an old diagram. And then it actually come outside onto the um, ovaries or even onto the outside of the uterus. So that's endometriosis. You've got endometrial tissue that has made it outside of the uterus, all right? It can cause significant pain. However, a lot of women are asymptomatic. It just depends. Estimated to occur in five to 10% of women. May respond to anti-inflammatory as well as hormones, all right? Um, and uh, in cases where that doesn't work, they go in with a laparoscope and uh, just try to, you know, take it all out of there. So one of my son's girlfriends had some endometriosis that was bothering her, she had some pain. So they went in, and I love the lower diagram on the left there, that shows it. What they do is one of those tubes is basically air, and what they do is they inflate the abdominal cavity. The problem is that the, you know, all your skin, your abdominal wall will, you know, when you lie on your back, it'll all flop down on top. So they inflate the abdominal cavity, and then they stick another tube in there that's got a light and some snippers or some suction or whatever, and they just go through, or cauterizing, I don't know exactly what they do there, but they basically just go in and try to get it out. In the lower right, you can see endometrial tissue on the outside of the uterus. They just basically have to clean that off one way or another. Um, my son's girlfriend said um, the next day, um, she was basically fine, except that inflating the abdomen um, left her, like it, it stretched everything out. She had like pain up in her shoulders and stuff, just from all the skin being stretched so much. She was actually in a lot of pain the next day. Um, she borrowed my opioids in order to get through that pain, which I was happy to give her because she is an awesome lady. Okay, so some female internal anatomy just continuing here. The cervical canal, all right, so the, the cervix is the neck of the uterus, all right. There is a, a narrow passageway there called the cervical canal, and it's bounded on both ends by the internal and external cervical os. Os is a root word that sometimes means bone, sometimes it means opening. So you can see the internal os is where the cervical canal opens into the um, uterine body, or in the uterine cavity, really. And then the external os opens into the uh, vagina, all right? So there you can see the two openings on each end of the cervical canal. Vagina roughly 10 centimeters in length. And uh, guess how long the average erect penis is? right around 10 centimeters. Nature just designed this perfectly. Vaginal rugi line the walls of the vagina. So remember rugi, we have those in the stomach, those are ridges. What are they? They're basically just a place where the tissue is kind of loose and it allows expansion. Remember, you gotta get a baby's head through there. All right, so you need the vagina to be able to stretch to accommodate that and that's what the rugi are for. The same way in your stomach, the rugi of your stomach allowed your stomach to stretch out like after you had a Thanksgiving dinner. All right, same thing here with the rugi and the vagina. Um, it's also said that the rugi provide little ridges that may provide stimulation during sex, all right? That's why a lot of condoms are ribbed. They're trying to mimic the rugi of the vagina. And uh, yeah, here you go, because they thought you'd never notice. There's the Dodge car um, logo, and there is the uterus. Damn, with the tubes and the ovaries. And here I love this. Somebody um, who is, uh, they have, University of Virginia has alumni license plates that have a big V for Virginia. So somebody got a personalized plate that said vagina, and when you match that up with the V for Virginia, by golly, they got a vagina license plate. Isn't that awesome? Okay, so looking at some of the external genitalia, I always kind of like have to catch my breath when I go to the slide. It kind of like jars me. I kind of like step back. 
Um, I think you're probably all familiar with this, maybe not exactly from this angle. Some of you may be only from this angle. You figure out who you are. Um, female genitalia, collectively known as the vulva. That's just a broad term describing the whole set of structures there. The vulva. Okay? The mons pubis covers the pubic symphysis. Mons literally means mountain. So the mons pubis is the pubic mountain. See, it doesn't look kind of like a mountain there. And it's got trees on it. Well, no, actually, that's hair. So the mons pubis normally covered with pubic hair, all right? Unless you're one of the people who shaves it off, and that's fine. This is America, damn it. You do whatever you want. Maybe you're one of the people who leaves a little landing strip. You know what I'm talking about? So labia major, majora, that's singular, or the labia majus, singular. Nobody ever uses the singular. Labia majora, or simply the labia major in English, are thick folds of skin inferior to the mons pubis. So, see the big outer folds, the labium magus, all right? Then, inside of those is the labia minora, singular labium minus, or simply the min labia minor in English, um, surround the vestibule, which contains the vaginal and urinary orifices. So, vestibule, remember, we've seen vestibule a few different places here. We saw the um, vestibule in the ear. We've seen vestibules in the oral cavity. Vestibule just means kind of like an open side chamber. So we've got, you know, basically in between the two labia minor is the vestibule. That's the whole space. And then the two openings within the vestibule are the vaginal orifice and the urethral orifice. Don't confuse vagina with the opening. The va vagina is an entire organ. The vagina is the entire tube. It's a muscular tube. The vaginal orifice is simply the opening into the vagina, which is the organ. The hymen consists of folds of vaginal mucosa that cover the vaginal orifice. So usually at birth, the vaginal orifice is not really completely open to the outside world. There is a layer of vaginal mucosa that cover that, all right? And there used to be a, a thing that would say that, you know, you could tell whether or not a female was a virgin or not. If her hymen was intact, she was a virgin. If the hymen had been broken, that meant she had sex and she was going to hell and she needed to be sent to her room and so on. As it turns out, you know, I mean, riding a bicycle, doing gymnastics, all kinds of things like that may break the hymen. So sometimes if the hymen is really intact, when it's first broken, there may be some blood. That comes to the, uh, that explains the somewhat vulgar phrase about popping a girl's cherry. Sometimes a virgin having sex for the first time, if the hymen is intact and it's broken for the first time, there may be little bits of blood. So um, I think that's a pretty rude term. I wouldn't suggest using that. Um, the clitoris is erectile tissue covered by a prepus. So, Actually, the clitoris, as we'll see, is formed by the junction of the labia minor, the prepus is. So the clitoris is actually a large organ that corresponds to the penis. And there are parts of the, most of the clitoris is not visible, it's underneath the skin. All you're really seeing is the glands of the clitoris. Remember we had the glands of the penis. All you're really seeing is the glands of the clitoris. And the glands of the clitoris is covered by a prepus, which was the foreskin for the male penis. Remember, we all started with the same junk, all right? It just got modified by the presence or absence of testosterone, modified by the presence, obviously. Um, so all the parts correspond, okay? Sometimes women will get piercings. They'll say they have a, a piercing of the clitoris. That's not usually done because I think that the pain from that would probably send you about three feet straight up in the air. Although, I don't know, some people get that done, I guess. Usually, the piercing is of the prepus, all right? So, um, they also often call them hood piercings because it's like the hood that goes over the glands of the clitoris, all right? So, let's take a look now underneath the skin, all right? So the glands of the clitoris, once again, is homologous to the glands of the penis. But look at the crust of the clitoris. See, there's a lot more to it. In the males, the, the two pieces of crust, crus, whatever you want to say, um, on either side, those would uh, together would form the shaft of the penis. Whereas in females, they spread out to surround um, the labia major. 
then um, the vestibular bulbs are underneath the labia major. So see the vestibular bulbs? Those are um, uh, erectile tissue, again, that become engorged with blood during sexual arousal. That's why when females are sexually aroused, the labia major may swell up and puff out. Um, you know, take a look next time, you know, if you get a chance. Um, they really will. Under sexual arousal, the labia major will puff up, and that's because of the vestibular bulbs, all right? And their purpose, probably, it's always, you know, speculation here, but what they do is they would tighten the vaginal orifice. Remember, the goal of sex is to make little parasites, and so you want to make sure that the male ejaculates. So what do you do? You try to tighten up the orifice because that gives more stimulation to the penis. So look at all these things in anatomy. I mean, look, they all, they're all connected to, you know, the ultimate goal, make a baby, all right? Make that little parasite. So lots of things contribute to that. And then also contributing, of course, um, sex. Sex without lube doesn't work, okay? And there's lots of natural lube. In fact, there are two organs that provide the lube. So um, the greater vestibular glands, notice those are basically on the south side of the, of the vaginal orifice. I mean, so to speak. I'm just speaking figuratively, metaphorically. But the greater vestibular glands are down there um, at the bottom of the vaginal orifice. They secrete lubricating fluid. And then also up on the top, um, on the north side, sort of, right next to the urethra are the paraurethral glands. Paraurethral means right next to the urethra. These are homologous to the prostate glands of the male, and they also secrete a lubricating fluid. So notice females basically have lubrication on both the north and south sides of the vagina, the vaginal orifice, because sex without lube just doesn't work very well. And so remember the males had the bulbourethral gland to coat the glands of the penis with lubricating fluid, and the females likewise have lubricating glands. Don't do sex without lubrication. It's not fun. Okay, and here you see actual picture. You can see there is, uh, you can see the urethra, you can see the vaginal orifice. Down at the bottom where it says the Bartholin's glands, that's the greater vestibular glands. And then the Skene's gland, that is the paraurethral. Notice how it's adjacent to the urethra, All right? The two lubricating glands. So I don't know, you might try this as an experiment. Take a, take a close up, take a look. Paraurethral are the ones thought to be involved in female ejaculation. Um, so, I just want to say that a lot of female ejaculation, um, what's supposed to be it, sometimes turns out to be just urination. Um, sometimes females during sexual excitement may um, secrete little bits of urine. And notice how the urethra is right next to the periurethral, so it'd be hard to tell unless you do a chemical analysis, and I don't think most people are going to you know, actually collect fluids and send it to the lab. I don't think most of us are willing to do that. Also thought to be involved in the so-called G-spot orgasms. I'll let you investigate this on your own. Some people say that's absolutely true. Other people say it's mostly a myth. You decide for yourself. Um, fluid produced is similar in composition to the fluid produced by the prostate gland in males. The periurethral glands are homologous to the prostate in males. All right. So once again, everything corresponds. Male and female, all the parts are the same, really. They just develop differently under the presence or absence of testosterone, and then they end up having slightly different but very similar functions, okay? And yeah, female, uh, the paraurethral glands often referred to as the female prostate, okay? So which is not one of the layers of the uterine wall, the mesometrium, the endometrium, the myometrium, the parametrium, or all our layers of the uterine wall? One of those is not right. There's no mesometrium, all right? Endomyopery, okay? Those are the only three. And so remember, males had that fun experience of the digital rectal exam. Females, their corresponding fun experience is the pap smear. So a speculum is inserted into the vagina to allow access to the cervix. Cells are collected from the external cervical os. Remember, the cervical canal has an internal opening and an external opening. And they'll usually just do a little swab there to check for the cancerous or precancerous cells, all right? And so it's basically the same thing. Males get the digital rectal exam to make sure they don't have prostate cancer. 
Females get a little swab to make sure they haven't got cervical cancer. It's basically just, you know, the way to try to make sure that we don't get more people dying from cancer of the reproductive system. Um, there are a variety of terms, uh, that, um, some vulgar, um, some in common usage, referring to the female genitalia. I just think it's interesting to see where they come from. So vulva comes from the root meaning a wrapper. So the vulva, the name for the whole female sexual apparatus, is the wrapper in the sense that it wraps around the penis. That's how it came to be that term, all right? Pudenda is another word, and that's from the Latin word for shame. You may remember from Bio 21 we had the pudendal nerve, which goes down to the genitals. But I think it's great that, you know, they would name it the pudenda as though, like, that's something you're supposed to be ashamed of. Humans, oh my God, what's wrong with humans? Um, panocha? meaning candy, sugar, pudding. It has a variety of meanings throughout the Spanish-speaking world. It means like different things in Mexico versus Argentina versus Spain. But generally, it's the candy. And you can think of some vulgar words, I'm sure, like panocha. Um, that uh, ultimately, the Latin name, another Latin name anyway, for the female genitals, um, that turned into a vulgar term. Normally in the classroom, I write this on the board. Um, so I don't have to say it out loud, but I don't know how to do that here in a uh, in an annotated PowerPoint. So the word is C U N N U S. That's another Latin name for the female genitals. C U N N U S. And why don't you see if you can think of a vulgar word for the female genitals that comes from that Latin root word? <laughs> 